once again, I'm Cliff Johnson. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington, and I'd like to tell you about the Andromeda Project. Um, I'll also mention that uh, a lot of the work that I'm showing today has also been in close collaboration with Anil Seth and uh, an assistant professor at University of Utah and also an undergrad there, Matt Wallace. So thanks to them for lots of slides. Um, so our basic goal for Andromeda Project is to look for and um, uh, identify stellar clusters in M31. Um, so to start out the talk, I just kind of wanted to give uh, a science motivation for why we'd want to do this. Um, so why do we care about star clusters? Um, the kind of the first category I would say for this is that uh, clusters, we can use these star clusters as probes of star formation. Um, so if we want to try to look into the galaxy um, formation history, we can actually use the age distribution of these clusters that we find in order to say something about the star formation history of these systems. Um, also, uh, kind of encoded in the, both the cluster mass function and uh, the fraction of stars that are formed in these bound clusters, you can tell us something about the physical conditions of star formation going on in the giant molecular clouds and kind of give us some handle on what's going on there. And so as a shout out to my PhD work, uh, my thesis is going to be focusing on this second aspect, the fraction of stars um, formed in bound clusters. So I'll give a little more detail here. Um, so literally what I'm doing is I'm defining this, uh, this parameter uh, gamma, which uh, we call the fraction of star formation in bound clusters. So bound clusters here being long-lived entities um, that are lasting 100 million years, um, give or take. Um, so what we do is we want to look at, as a function of star formation environment or star formation rate density, we want to look at the mass of clusters, um, mass of stars that are formed in these bound clusters versus the total amount of stellar mass that's being formed. Um, and so there's actually been interesting work in uh, looking at kind of galaxy-wide samples of these star clusters and actually showing this interesting relation between uh, star formation rate density um, in a galaxy and this uh, parameter gamma. And so this is um, hopefully going to give us some insight into uh, exactly what's going on in these star forming regions um, and the differences across uh, this, the range of star formation rate density, um, which I like to kind of think of as just being environmental dependence of um, possible environmental dependence for star formation. Um, to have a little bit of more of a visual example, so in other words, at low star formation rate densities going on in kind of these very flocculent, um, low mass spiral galaxies like NGC 45, um, you have a lower fraction of your stars that are actually bound up in these clusters. Um, as you go to kind of more and more extreme environments, and, you know, topping out at kind of the objects like, you know, these giant uh, merging galaxy systems, that you're actually going to find a very high fraction of uh, clusters of mass being formed in these bound clusters. Um, but this is also something that has been... Sorry, yes, Steve. So you thought this stuff makes more sense to be kind of average across the whole galaxy? Yes. Yes, exactly. And so that's actually one of the things that we're hoping to be able to kind of dig deeper into is, you know, so, right, there's definitely a variation of environments across these, you know, entire systems. So can we actually come and do this sort of gamma work on a resolved, spatially resolved basis within a galaxy um, to really show if, you know, these are kind of statistical fluctuations or if, you know, there really is physics behind this. And so going down to the smaller scales in nearby galaxies will allow us to do that. Um, the other, the second aspect of why we care about star clusters is really that uh, these clusters actually give us, you know, a really um, well calibrated age for a particular set of stars. So it actually lets us go in and um, assess the, what the, the shape of and the form of the initial mass function, the stellar initial mass function, um, these objects where we don't have that degeneracy between star formation history and, and uh, the, the slope of the mass function. And also we can actually use these um, sources um, for stellar model calibration. Um, and so, for instance, this, you know, uh, we have seven red supergiants in one of these kind of uh, moderate mass clusters. And so this actually can give us a handle on, as a function of age, you know, uh, what, what the, the lifetimes for these kind of rare phases of stellar evolution are. Yeah. So, so especially for the set of normal calibration, um, is there any reason to think that things like binarity and uh, you know, close interaction of these star clusters might mess you up if you look compared to the field, or, or do we think that they're basically the same? Um, so that's definitely, I would say, an open question. Um, I definitely like, I, I think our philosophy here is that you know, we're going to do as well as we can in each of these different environments. I mean, so uh, the survey is also taking on trying to do the stellar model calibration also using the full field, but right, you're giving up 
pers uh, precision in that age information that you're able to attach by going to the field. Um, so it's definitely give or take, and that's something that we can look at. Okay. Um, so, you know, with those kind of science drivers in hand, we can actually start to, you know, kind of come up with requirements for what we want out of this uh, stellar cluster catalog. And so, right, as big as possible, you know, the more uh, clusters that we have for calibration, the better off we're going to do. Um, also, um, really, we really want clusters where we can individually resolve out those single stars in order to actually get detailed information about, you know, how many, you know, particular AGB stars are in these stellar clusters. Um, also, for a lot of the mass function work and the bound fraction work, we'd really like to have a wide dynamic range in cluster parameters, um, especially being able to go down to lower masses where um, differences in the mass function may be more apparent. And also, we'd really like to make sure that the data set that we're using is very well calibrated, that we're not, and that there's some systematic assessment of our cluster completeness and of that population that we're identifying. All right. So, with all these requirements, uh, we're hoping to do better um, by studying a nearby galaxy with a uniform, um, high-quality data set, and it'll allow us to, you know, really test a lot of these uh, models for formation and dissolution of clusters. Um, and that data set that I'm going to use for my PhD is uh, the FAT data set, the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury. So this was a treasury program with HST overtaken over the last three years, um, and have spent about 800 HST orbits in order to map out um, about a third of the Andromeda galaxy um, in six different wavelengths, um, varying from the near UV out to the near IR. Um, so it's an incredible data set. Uh, my advisor, uh, Julianne Dauphin, is the PI of the project, um, and you'd see more information in that survey paper. Um, this is a little bit of an aggressive undertaking because uh, this little red square actually symbolizes um, a single field of view of the WC3 IR camera. Um, so that's really why this took you know, just so much time to actually map out this whole part of the galaxy and a reference of the full moon for reference. And of course it looks better on my screen than up on, uh, up on the projector. Um, this is actually an image from the outskirts uh, of the survey and hopefully I'll just be able to zoom right in here. But what you can see is that we're really able to resolve out um, individual stars in the galaxy. And so in all we have something like uh, 120, um, sorry, 120,000 different uh, individual uh, photometric points. Um, and so we just have a massive catalog of resolved stars with which we can do you know, a whole host of stellar populations work um, and also you know, work in clusters. Um, so specifically for the star clusters, what we get is you know, individual uh, resolved star um, photometry within the, within the particular clusters. Um, this is a huge improvement over kind of state of the art um, data sets that were taken from the ground for M31 you know, actually being able to resolve out the individual stars instead of it just being a fuzzy blob. And so what we're left with is actually a CMD, uh, color magnitude diagram, of all these uh, stars in the cluster. Um, so I've kind of grayed out the background source, but you can see that we're really able to um, resolve, you know, tens to hundreds of main sequence stars within the massive clusters. And so that's where the Andromeda Project comes in. Um, once again, state of the art for uh, finding and identifying stellar clusters has been actually undertaken by eye surveys in order to identify these sources, um, especially because of the range, the dynamic range in terms of age, in terms of mass. Um, it makes it a very hard problem to actually attack algorithmically. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've, uh, the Andromeda Project is a perfect fit um, in order to actually, you know, make this go a lot faster um, instead of poor side grad student like me having to identify all these clusters by eye. Um, so by the numbers, Andromeda Project, which is, uh, has been completed with uh, data collection for a while. Um, we had about 20,000 image subjects, so this is you know, a much smaller project than most of the other uh, Zooniverse projects that have been undertaken before. And that's a combination of um, fat imaging, archival imaging, and also um, imaging with synthetic clusters inserted. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but in all, we had uh, uh, 1.82 million image classifications, which is greater than 80 per subject, which has really given us a well-sampled um, kind of look at what the identifications these system scientists were making. Um, so in all, it was 25 days of data collection um, in the kind of fall of 2012 and 2013, and we're just finishing up the catalog and analysis work now. Um, and so we had over 29,000 unique users. One little interesting nugget that I pulled out um, was that actually we only have 
for the registered users who participated, which was only about uh, 9,500, I think, uh, only 4% of them actually participated in both rounds. And so we didn't have a lot of people who, you know, came back to the second round specifically to participate. Um, there was a lot of people who were looking like they were just coming and going. You did get lots of complaints from people who, by the time they found out about it, <laughs> missed the boat. That's true, too. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and so just a couple quick histograms of, you know, really, you know, most projects we see this, you know, big ramp up after a, a newsletter and then kind of a long exponential tail. Um, the beauty of uh, the size of data that we were working with was that we never really made it out to the tail. Um, we were done with data collection before we were really, you know, kind of out in the doldrums. Um, so one notable spike was actually uh, this here, which was our, you know, peak hour. And this is nothing compared to uh, the, the BBC program response. Um, but we were pretty uh, excited about having more than 30,000 um, classifications done in a single hour. And that actually happened after we got a plug from um, I effing love science, a, uh, a Facebook group, um, which sent their followers in droves um, in order to help us out. And so that was a huge, huge help. And also I should mention that we were barely a blip, that we weren't even the most you know, popular or second most popular post that day on this Facebook group. But yet, you know, we were able to do you know, our science you know, based a lot in part because of these, these people helping us out. Okay, um, so I just wanted to um, show a couple um, quantifications of what our, you know, our citizen science um, volunteer force looks like. And so about half of the classifications committed came from the top 500 participants. Um, so I've sorted all the users kind of going in and uh, the top users are over here on the left and then the uh, lower users are over here on the right and this curve actually shows the number of classifications per user um, and then the cumulative fraction of all the classifications. So half are coming from people who did um, you know, about, uh, you know, and they were doing, you know, a few hundred classifications, five, six hundred classifications. Um, but interestingly, uh, you know, we actually had 85% of the work done by people who were doing 100 classifications or more. Um, I, th I think coming into the project, I really thought there was going to be a lot higher percentage of work done by very casual users who were doing, you know, 10 or 20 classifications and going away. Um, we actually had, you know, a decently high level engagement. It would be interesting to see what the comparison was with other projects. Yeah? Is the classification really a one star for the whole? Thank you. Uh, no, the cl a classification here is um, I view one image, I identify all the sources in that image or no sources, however it may be, and then per submission. Yes? Yeah, so because of the submission, that could mean that people press submission even so there was something to classify, but they didn't. Yes, that is possible. So is that clean up in here in this statistic? Yeah, okay. Uh, no, not in these statistics. But I mean, that's, we can talk about that a little bit later because I do talk about um, user waiting in just a couple slides. Um, so uh, just to see a little bit of what our data looks like, um, Matt Wallace, the undergrad from Utah, actually put together this kind of nice shiny video um, available on YouTube. Um, actually showing what the different classifications look like. So here all the white circles are actually cluster classifications and then green circles over plot at the end actually show galaxy classifications. Um, so you'll see definitely a, a large variety um, in kind of the identifications people are giving. A lot of just single stars are circled, um, but all of those will be at like very um, low confidence. And um, some, you know, definitely sometimes there are some confusion between objects of being identified as galaxies or clusters. And so, um, so each of these images have 80 views per image. Um, we actually, uh, round two actually has close to 100 people per image, um, but it's pretty flat across the board. All right, so um, just to kind of step through this process, the cataloging process in a little bit more detail. Um, so we start out with our raw image. This is actually all of the, the image drawings for this particular image. I showed this here to show that, you know, some people really did go all out in the same thing, the same example that Stephen was showing for uh, Moon Zoo. We definitely have, you know, a lot of low confidence hits in the data set as well. But fortunately, with the large number of views that we have, you know, these show up as being, you know, kind of uh, very, very, um, you know, low per vote percentage and so that we can really filter those out. Um, and so after using clustering algorithm in order to identify the sources, uh, we get a catalog of um, good cluster candidates. Here, um, identified using the cluster fraction. I'll uh, denote that as cluster frac. So it's the percent of people who identified that particular object in the image as a cluster of the total number of people who looked at that image. 
Um, so in all, uh, this is our catalog result. Um, so we have uh, more than 3,500 star clusters identified um, over the full span of the FAT survey and over 2,300 background galaxies also identified. And so this is using a simple thresholding um, based off of kind of completely unweighted um, uh, classifications. And so we can do a little bit better, but in, in practice, you know, to kind of uh, spoiler alert, um, that these numbers actually don't change a whole lot when we actually apply the user weighting. Um, so I'll get to that next. Um, so once again, this is a huge improvement um, on previous data sets. Um, we went from something like 450 clusters. Um, here's a histogram of their magnitude distributions. Um, so bright on the left, paint on the right. Um, and really with the HST data set and that improved resolution, we're able to tell the difference between a single bright star and a you know, small compact star cluster. And so really we were able to you know, probe down um, much more into the faint cluster regime. And uh, so really our, you know, this huge spike um, is really going to go into mostly lower mass, less than 10 to the 3 solar mass clusters that are, you know, between 100 and 150 million years old, um, completely untouched by any survey before. Um, so I wanted to show uh, one plot on our user weighting results and actually showing that uh, what we've done here is taken one step beyond kind of the simple consensus um, weighting. And so that simple consensus weighting is actually kind of what you see on the y-axis here. And so we just look at, you know, all the objects identified, what are the average cluster fracts for these objects? Um, and so, you know, kind of people who only click on good things are here at the top, and people who click on lots of worse clusters are here at the bottom. Um, but we also do add a second metric here, um, which was if we look at all the good clusters, which we define as, you know, being some threshold here, we've chosen uh, a cluster frac of greater than 0.7. Um, what fraction, you know, what was the completeness of those, you know, high, high instance um, clusters? And so we actually use this second metric in order to have a uh, non-detection weighting in, in addition to a detection weighting. So if someone comes along in an image and doesn't identify anything, right, you know, that can actually tell us a lot of information if they are very high completeness, you know, users. But, you know, if they don't ever click on anything, we want to make sure that, you know, the, the lack of any clicking, you know, gets used properly. So using a detection weighting and a non-detection weighting um, really has allowed us to do that. But does that mean you have an idea of how many clusters they roughly are? So if you didn't know that information... Yes, you yeah, you right, so this is all based off of, this particular, you know, metric is based off of the a cluster frac threshold of 0.7. But so. do you know that most of your images have a, have a cluster in it? So if you... Is it based knowing that information? So if you had most of your images didn't have something in it, would that change this? Um, yes, it very well may. Um, yeah, in terms of generalizing this to other projects, um, it's certainly right. This particular threshold and you know the prevalence of these good clusters and how many of those clusters you actually get to make sure that I mean right you for the the users plotted here with greater than 100 classifications. Um, we have very, you know, decent number statistics on the number of good clusters that they have seen over the course of, you know, all their classifications. Yeah, so that's definitely something to keep in mind for generalizing this. Um, another thing we can do is actually compare to an expert-derived catalog. So this is actually my catalog paper from 2012, um, where we, uh, and by we, I mean a team of six PhD astronomers sat down and actually did the exact same exercise as we did um, for Andromeda Project of just going through the images and clicking. Um, and so using those 601 clusters, we can actually, you know, go back and look at um, uh, and compare the catalog contents. And so here I'm going to actually show a plot of, you know, the completeness of the year one catalog within, you know, aerial matched regions and um, showing that, you know, in order to get about a 90% completeness for that year one catalog, that expert derived catalog, um, we end up with, you know, an additional contamination of between 15 and 20%. Um, of additional sources that are um, also identified as part of the catalog um, procedure. Um, now, what's interesting about this is um, this is a little bit of an ROC curve, um, but uh, I also wanted to show this plot to show that, you know, by applying a weighting scheme, we do get some moderate amount of improvement um, and a reduction in the number of contaminants as a function of that, um, of that cluster completeness. Um, just a one quick note on this is that, you know, our expert catalog you know, what that we want to use as that gold standard um, comparison does have its issues. Um, so, you know, particularly what we assumed as being clusters, um, 
you know, that there was a lot of personal bias from those astronomers coming in. And so, you know, having a particular cluster definition, you know, for the AP catalog versus the year one catalog has allowed for some differences, you know, in the number, in the completeness fraction, but perhaps, you know, that there's not really a difference in quality between one over the other, as long as we're all consistent about, you know, what objects we're identifying um, at a certain time. Um, and there was definitely some, we, uh, through AP, have actually identified methodology kind of problems and issues um, that we were actually, you know, kind of uh, rolling into our year one catalog. And really, in, in the end, we really believe that the AP catalog is really a better sampling um, of the true kind of uh, cluster probabilities for objects. Um, finally, just one word that we did use um, a set of uh, more than 3,000 synthetic clusters um, inserted into the images. Um, it was nice to actually provide some user feedback as they were going along to under, you know, to kind of give confidence to some of the users about, you know, whether they were doing it right, um, which is something that we often encounter. Um, and that, you know, being able to uh, have these synthetic clusters, um, applying the exact same cataloging techniques, we're actually able to say something very detailed about the cluster completeness of this catalog. Um, and so in comparison to, you know, previous uh, cluster catalogs and other extragalactic systems, you know, oftentimes we just assume that it's, you know, that the completeness limit is just some simple magnitude limit. And really through Andromeda Project, we've realized that, you know, this doesn't really apply and that, you know, that our uh, catalog completeness limit does have an age dependence to it. No. Thank you. I, I actually should have mentioned this earlier. So uh, as for reference, our current cluster catalog uses a um, cluster frac threshold of about 35, so 0 0.35. So 35% of people actually clicking on something um, makes it actually a pretty, you know, decently reliable. Um, if you actually increase that threshold to 0 0.6, um, that, you know, this curve, you know, drops off quickly. And so you can think of each of these different um, kind of completeness thresholds for year one as being a different cluster frac threshold. And you can see that this really flattens out to almost zero contamination if you go to, you know, a cluster frac threshold of 0.6 or 0.7, for instance. So just 0.35, that's like the one that has Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, you know, so, but for any of these, you know, kind of limits that we apply, um, we can actually then go back through and using the synthetic clusters really say, you know, what is our mass completeness? And so for the Andromeda project, you know, we're having 50% mass completeness at about 500 solar masses um, for clusters that are less than 100 million years. Um, so we're doing really well here. Um, so uh, just to finish here, um, we have definitely just kind of crossed the threshold with having our final catalog in hand. Um, so the cluster catalog we expect to be submitted here in the next couple months. And following that um, is a whole host of cluster projects that we've just been gnawing at the bit to really get going um, from uh, both the Andromeda project team, but also from the FAT team at large. Um, so these clusters will actually um, become inputs for, you know, looking at the age and mass determinations um, for the cluster system within M31, um, looking at kind of other uh, cluster profile fitting, just characterization of the sample. Um, and a whole host of different science projects. And so I'm definitely uh, most excited about uh, my PhD thesis looking at this bound cluster formation. And um, also uh, uh, I'm collaborating with Dan Weiss and actually doing the detailed IMF determinations of hundreds of star clusters um, in M31. Um, and so I just want to put in one plug that uh, there are definitely some other projects that our FAT team is interested in looking at. Um, one is doing H1 hole identification. Uh, there's actually a nice H1, high resolution H1 data set um, PI'd, by, um, PI'd by Adam Leroy. And uh, to actually go in and identify some of these H1 holes, which is, once again, very hard to do uh, algorithmically, um, can actually say something about, you know, star formation feedback processes um, within the galaxy. Um, also, uh, while there are kind of H2 derived um, H2 region catalogs for M31, um, you know, a lot of these have issues of, you know, really for coherent structures, breaking them up into their, you know, isolated, you know, little uh, emission knots. And so to actually go in and be able to correlate, you know, large kind of extended structures um, with uh, surrounding stellar populations is something that we'd be interested in as well. Um, and I'll finish there. Thank you.
So I, I will only speak as far as you know star clusters in this particular you know science, where yeah, there have been huge disagreements in the literature, and uh, and a lot of them come about star clusters, and a lot of them come back to what we want to define as being you know a bound cluster. And so you know for a lot of my work, looking at the bound fraction, I care if something is oh, perfect, if something is kind of a loose association that is likely to not be gravitationally bound versus something that clearly is centrally concentrated. And right, so a lot of this is actually just it's not necessarily, you know, tool differences. It's 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 really um, you know philosophy. And I mean right, and so AP catalog catalog is actually nice because we have everything. And now I'll really be able to go in and, you know, yes, there will have to be additional cuts in order to try to weed out objects that, you know, are clustered but aren't that aren't likely bound clusters. Which is another argument for not being too specific about what we try to do. Yes, exactly. You the flexibility if you can get away with it. Exactly. Yeah. Michael, but I mean, comment on that for planet four because you know marking high detail high rise images on the ground, I think it's very important that the scientists use the same tool because there's an inherent precision that just comes from using a certain tool, right. which is the pixel resolution and so on. So there, it would be really important. Yeah. Um, we, uh, there's a question by Twitter from Phil Marshall, who is <laughs> currently in the immigration line. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's managed to at least follow on Twitter. So, awesome. so his question is about why, so I remember the project was clearly much more rapid than we thought it was going to be. So do you have a sense of why it was a popular project? And we actually had a kind of a discussion on, on talk at one point, and <laughs> I uh, I think I think a lot of the our science team has really thinks that the discovery aspect of the project made it very appealing. Um, that it's it's much like Snapshot Serengeti where you just want to keep clicking until you get to that line because you know there's a line in there somewhere. <laughs> and that it, it's very same way that it, uh, I think kind of discovery discovery projects like this have that same kind of appeal of you know you just want to keep going because you're not sure what's going to come up but. Snapshot Serengeti is the strongest project. I I would be happy to have that. <laughs> as, 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 as. But there are no lions in the Andromeda project. Actually. Not that we have seen so far. Yeah. Um, okay, well, no more questions. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and the next job. Well, not. <laughs> <laughs> no,